Good evening. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Matt Thompson. And it's my pleasure to serve as the president of Kansas Wesleyan. We're glad that you're joining us for this conversation. We're thrilled with the turnout. So thank you all so much. I know that we have students and faculty, staff, community members, former uh, faculty members and staff members who are with us tonight. So thank you for being a part of this conversation tonight. Kansas Wesleyan is proud to be the host for this event because we believe part of our role in the community, both the Salina community and the broader world community, is to be a place for people to come together for conversations about matters that matter. And so we're excited to be a part of this night tonight, and um, we appreciate the Land Institute asking us to be a part of hosting uh, this presentation tonight. And now to introduce our guest speaker is Dr. Aubrey Strite Krug. Thank you, President Thompson, and thank you for pronouncing my name perfectly. Um, I'm Aubrey Strykrug. I'm the director of a program called Ecosphere Studies at the Land Institute, and we're really delighted to be able to partner with Kansas Wesleyan um, to offer this event. If you're interested in learning more about the Land Institute, there are some sign-up sheets going around to sign up for a newsletter and more information, so you can keep an eye out for those. Um, the Land Institute is happy to work with Kansas Wesleyan in many ways. Um, this semester I've been teaching an eco-writing class. I'm happy to see some of my students here. Um, and uh, we're also happy to participate in this type of community resilience work together. So Dr. Nate Higgins, joining us tonight, has a master's degree in finance from the University of Chicago on one end and a PhD in natural resources from the University of Vermont on the other. He went from 10 years at Wall Street to teaching a course at the University of Minnesota right now called Reality 101. So he is an impressive um, synthesizer of a framework for our future, which we think is totally crucial. And uh, I just overheard him say that how he made that move in his own life um, what had to do with a couple of very important books that he read. Um, so as a teacher of English and writing, that thrilled me. I hope it thrills my students to know that we have uh, such great capacity to learn and be changed by single moments in our life. And in that spirit of true education, I'm really pleased. I hope you'll join me in welcoming Dr. Nate Higgins to speak with us. Thank you. Glad to be here. Um, so I'm going to do something a little bit different tonight. Uh, I've never done this particular talk before. The only things that are similar, this is the ninth Earth Day in a row that I've spoken. Uh, the only things similar to last year was that I'm going to mention energy quite often and that I didn't have time to get a haircut. Um, <laughs> So this painting is a famous painting from Paul Gauguin um, that in the upper left in French is um, who are we, uh, where do we come from, where are we going? And it's kind of a story of uh, his life, metaphorically. I'm going to talk about the story of our species and our culture so far. Um, so. About 10,000 years ago, uh, the glaciers receded and the end of the last ice age happened. Um, and around five, no, no fewer than five places on the earth, humans began agriculture as a way of life. Fast forward 10,000 years to today, and we have this massive globalized civilization, seven and a half billion humans, commerce, money, trade, everything at a three and a half percent growth rate, which was roughly last year's global growth rate, we will double the energy and material throughput that it took our species 10,000 years to amass in the next 25 years. So the average college student today, if business as usual continues, will see two of those doublings in her lifetime, which means when they're in their 70s will be 4x times today. Is that possible? Is that desirable? What are some of the variables that will come to bear on that happening? What are some of the impacts? 
Um, now, the story I'm going to tell is almost the perfect storm for the human brain to ignore and reject because it is complex, it is threatening, a little bit scary, it's in the future, not today. Um, it is abstract and there's no immediate things that we can go out to do to solve it. And so for all those reasons, um, everything's going kind of well in our society. It's, it's almost impossible to get people to agree on this and to act. There's some seats up in front, you standing in the back, come on down. Um, so with that in mind, uh, I'm going to just start with my main conclusions. Um, okay, thank you very much. <laughs> no. <laughs> I was trying to set this so that, uh, okay, stopwatch, because I wanted to see how long I was going. Uh, I've never given this talk before, and I have no idea how long it's going to be, so I'll try to talk a little. It's the fewest slides I've ever used, but it's, I don't know how long it'll take. Approximately 53 minutes, but we'll see. But my three main takeaways are that energy underpins uh, natural systems and human economies, and we're living midway through a one-time uh, geological carbon pulse of coal oil and natural gas extraction. Uh, we're headed, uh, whether we choose to or not, towards a world with less physical uh, consumption, but doesn't have to be emotional, psychological uh, well-being. And after basic needs are met, the best things in life are free. So those are my conclusions. I'm no longer going to talk about those. Um, what I'm going to do is talk about the fact that the things in our world are not black and white. Most things are gray. Most things are on a spectrum. Most things are on a continuum. Uh, and I'm going to uh, suggest 40 of these continuums that will have a bearing on our collective future. I'm going to break these continuums into five categories. Uh, the economy, uh, human behavior, the environment, our culture, and individual. Uh, so let's start with economy. Um, so we have the continuum of energy versus everything else. So most Americans are unaware of how energy underpins our societies. Every single good and service produced in our economies has something in common. It first has an energy conversion. We cannot have any good or service produced in our economy without using energy. You look at a supermarket shelf in a Walmart or a local grocery store, everything there took a little fire somewhere on the planet to either produce, package, ship, or get to the stores. The graph on the right um, shows um, energy consumption on the bottom axis versus GDP or economic output on the left axis. And you can see over the last uh, 50 years, it's incredibly correlated with energy consumption. The last few years, we've kind of started to diverge a little bit. Um, there are reasons for that we can get into in the Q&A. But basically, energy is a very special commodity in our economic systems. So there's two kinds of energy and resources. There are flows and there are stocks. Um, so this is a picture of me and one of my draft horses. My draft horse is one horse. I'm about an eighth of a horse. My little uh, utility vehicle is, does the work of 45 horsepower. It has the power of 45 horses with just a few of this amount of cups worth of diesel fuel in there. And then my, my truck does the work of 150 horses. So one barrel of oil, which we currently pay around $60 for, has 5.7 million BTUs worth of energy. If you translate that into human work output, it's four and a half years of me plowing the fields, digging ditches, putting up insulation, hammering in boards, four and a half years of my labor, which at the average American uh, wage of $31,000, is around $130,000 $130, of work we get for $60. All we had to do was ex pay for the extraction out of the earth. So our society is built on stocks 
that are depletable on human time scales, yet our culture treats these as if they were flows. A flow is something like sunlight or a river or rain. Um, so there's a, there's a disconnect here. Now, if you look at me and my horse, those are flow-based, you know, in human history, those were things that could be supported by flows. You can't easily support my truck or my utility vehicle on flows, but on this energy dense carbon in fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas. Uh, the average American today uses 54 barrel of oil equivalents of energy every day, every year, sorry. Uh, and we import another 15. So each of us, without knowing it, has approximately 300 years worth of fossil slaves standing behind us doing our bidding. So each of us consumes 200,000 calories a day, but our bodies only consume 2,000. So this is a 100 to 1 ratio that is supported by these geologic stocks. Then we have the relationship of stocks versus abstractions. So money is created from thin air. Money comes into the banking system with no relationship to the underlying resources underpinning it. This has been true since the gold standard stopped in 1971. Uh, so when a money is created, there's no reference to how much oil or energy or land or, or these other things that we have. And yet money is created from paper, actually linen, um, and takes very little energy and resources to create. Our representations of what we think we own are created from thin air, where what we really own is tethered to this one-time pulse of these highly concentrated ores and energies. Gross versus net which you're all familiar from uh, paying your taxes. If you make $50,000 a year, you don't get to spend all 50, you have to pay some to the government. The same way that a cheetah has to expend energy when it's attacking a prey, and if it goes 15 times in a row without getting prey, it might have a problem because it doesn't have the metabolic output in order to go fast and kill its prey. In the same way, our civilization has energy underpinning everything that we do. And this graph on the right shows the last 700 years of how much, what percent of the income of the GDP of, the, of England went towards energy and food. And for many of those years, it was 100%. 100% of a person's income during the year went towards their energy and food. And right now, um, back until 1999, we were at 5%. 5% of our society was spent on the energy finding, the energy refining, the energy delivery. And the other 95% was NASCAR and, and uh, shopping centers and Disneyland and airplane trips and all the other things. As we get further and further into these fossil stocks, they're going to be become more expensive. We're going to have to use more of each of them to direct towards their own extraction, which will leave less for the rest of society. So that curve on the far right is going to be going up in our lifetimes. Another continuum is the difference between jewels and work. So there are lots of things that can harness and harvest and extract energy. For example, solar panels would be one. But what they give us, the benefits to human systems, the work that they provide is wildly disparate depending on their energy density, their variability, their intermittence, their geographic location, how much they cost, what are the non-energy inputs involved, um, and things like that. So there's a big difference in our societies on jewels versus work and the punchline here is renewable energy is mature it's gotten very cheap um, but the type of energy that it is is not going to plug and play our current society we can't go to hundred percent renewable energy and live like we do now 
uh, a lot more renewable energy is going to mean a different sort of lifestyle. Economy versus economics. So for those of you that haven't taken uh, economics, I will summarize what economics is briefly. Is we take energy and natural resource, we turn it into dollars, which gives us brain feelings plus waste. And repeat that at a larger scale. But economic theory uh, has, this is the last uh, 2,000 years of economic output for our species. And you can see there were 500 year periods of flat to declining uh, growth, um, which was the average consumption of the average person times the number of people. Um, but the little uh, red box in the upper right was this one time unique period of massive upward growth where the average American now is, has 50 times the income than the average human did 200 years ago. We are richer than kings or queens from the past. And during that little period in that box, all the economic theories were designed. Um, but I think they were right for the wrong reasons and we're beginning to see that they don't offer much predictive uh, ability for what's coming. Okay, human behavior I think is, is very important. So first of all, there's a distinction between how unbelievably special we are, we are clever, we are capable, we are flexible, and yet we are animals. We are mammals and we are apes. We're very special, but we are sub still subject to the laws of, of nature in the way that other animals are. Um, so proximate versus ultimate. So why do you want that job? Why does Facebook feel really good? Why do you feel jealous when your friend is flirting with your boyfriend? Why do you um, really want to buy that pair of shoes or that new car? There are surface or proximate answers to these questions, and there are ultimate or evolutionary answers to these questions. So this is a screenshot from a very popular game uh, called Fortnite. Who, which of you all have played Fortnite? Any of you? Okay, a couple of you in the back. So Fortnite hijacks our evolutionary impulses amazingly. You start with 100 people and you fight and shoot and down to one. And then you win and you get all these accolades. So the person that is playing that game is getting the proximate feeling of relaxation and entertainment. But their brain doesn't think that. Their brain thinks they are actually competing in a real live war against another tribe. Then if they win, they're going to get higher status, higher rewards within the tribe. So there's a proximate and an ultimate story for much of our modern behavior. Beliefs versus facts. Science and words are a very recent um, invention for our species. So the mind can invent thousands or millions of times more possibilities than exist in the real world. And our brains can easily be, be tricked into some vision or some story that makes us feel good and we want to be a part of, even though it's not based in reality. And this is also why many of us are arguing with our friends on Facebook with various facts about fill in the blank, and it does nothing, or it does very little, because people don't really respond to facts. Um, they respond to feelings. And so the physical world um, is our reality, but our evolutionary past led us to this moment we evolved to be wrong. And we have a lot of blind spots about our physical world. Now versus the future. So as biological organisms, we care about right now. We care about this weekend. We care about watching an NBA playoff game and having some chicken wings and some beer rather than worry about climate change or species extinction or energy depletion or any of the other stuff I'm going to talk about tonight. Why? Because our ancestors that focused on the present outcompeted those ancestors that were worried about some esoteric event in the future. We are hyper-focused on the near term. And that's a problem because most of our societal, cultural, environmental challenges are in the long term, in the future.
There's something in biology and ethology called supernormal stimuli, where scientists um, exaggerate a trait in an organism's environment. And the case on the left is these scientists painted a baby bird or, or a, a popsicle stick bright red, and they made the popsicle stick bigger than the real baby birds in the nest. What happened is the mama bird preferentially gave the worms and grubs to the fake popsicle stick because the cues of red and big shouted to that baby, uh, to the mama bird's brain, this offspring is going to be more likely to survive. I want to preferentially give resources to that bird. That happens every day to all of us with Candy Crush and Words with Friends and Facebook likes. How come that my, my friend didn't like my posts? He should have liked my posts. We're re-going through all the really high points of our ancestral past, trying to get those same feelings. But our modern technology, our modern social media can hijack uh, these uh, responses. Relative versus absolute. So once our basic needs are met, once we have our food and our shelter uh, and, and a job um, and a roof over our heads, we intensely care about comparing ourselves to others. Um, and that's a real problem in our culture because our culture is um, measuring success so far, largely in who has the biggest house and the largest paycheck. And so People, even if they're making 40 grand a year, think they're losers because their neighbor's making 50 grand or 80 grand or whatever it is. Um, I talked, uh, gave a talk earlier today at, at Wes Jackson's place. Uh, there's this, this video online by uh, a biologist showing these capuchin monkeys that do a task, they give a rock for a food treat reward. And they'll both be happy to do it for a cucumber. But once one of them starts getting a grape instead of a cucumber, the one that was formerly happy to do the work for a cucumber gets really upset and throws the cucumber back at the experimenter because he's no longer being, getting a fair shake. We are not that dissimilar from that. We do not like imperfect slights when someone is getting more than us because we feel it's unfair. Relative versus absolute, huge bearing on our environmental situation. Wants versus haves, another one of our uh, evolutionary kind of uh, uh, monkey traps. So the wanting of something is way more powerful than the having of something. So as one example, um, I like to look for agates and fossils. Um, so I live by the, uh, the Mississippi River and I go and look in the quarries for these agates, which are billion-year-old rocks, which are beautiful. And I love doing it, because it's like a oh, dumb rock, dumb rock, dumb rock, agate, yeah, and I get all excited. I have buckets of agates that I've never looked at after I picked them. It's the picking of them that I enjoy, not the having of them. But the same thing can be expanded towards shoes, or shopping centers, or houses. Um, it's once we have the thing, that was the peak of our dopamine, the peak of our neurotransmitter experience, which declines, and then you have to buy something new to get the same uh, reaction. And this is my storage shed, which is the ghost of dopamine past, which I have not been in there in four years. So all the things that I've bought in the past, which still have economic value, I've never even been in, I can't even walk in there. So that is, again, a microcosm of our culture. Wants versus needs. So consumption on the bottom graph versus fulfillment. And this has been shown all over the world in many different cultures, in many different circumstances, that once, if you're very poor, a big increase in income and energy and food makes you significantly better off. But once you reach a certain level, above that level, you get very little increased well-being from more from more money, more stuff. In the USA, that level is around $60,000. So if you're making 70,000 or 700,000 or 7 million, and I would argue as a former Wall Street broker, the guys making 7 million are less happy than the ones making 70 grand because they have too many people bugging them about money and they have so many accountants and taxes, it's just crazy. 
But the point is, is that after a minimum is reached, most of the things in life don't come from more stuff. This is uh, uh, a good friend of mine, Josh, who uh, both of us live quite simply, and we like music and food and drink, and all these things are relatively low on the, the throughput. Me versus us is another key behavioral dynamic. So we are both cooperative and comp uh, competitive as a species, as a biological organism. We really, at the end of the day, care about ourselves. If something bad is coming, we think about ourselves first. We do think about others, but the, this reaction of looking out for number one first is in us. It's in all of us. But also, we have intense tribal instincts because of our ancestral uh, living on the Pleistocene in bands of 50 to 100 people. We intensely care about our in-group whether that's a Kansas City Chiefs football, or American, or Salina, or Kansas Wesleyan sports teams, um, or the um, Eco Writing Club, or, or whatever it is, we care about our group versus the next group. So the way this manifests in our everyday lives is all of us, everyone sitting here tonight, has both of these dynamics going on at all times. We care about me versus us, and we care about us versus them. Uh, here there's a football team where the one person in yellow might go to the NFL. He cares about his individual performance, but he also cares about his team beating the other team. So these are some of the dynamics that we're going to experience in, in coming decades. Me versus us, us versus them. Genes versus culture. So a lot of these things relate to the agenda of the gene. We are biological organisms. We're walking forward, but our eyes are kind of looking backward um, because we are not trying to destroy the planet. We're not trying to do bad things. We're trying to get the same feelings that our successful ancestors got. So that's the agenda of the gene. But there's at a different level, we have the me versus the us, the us versus them, but we also have the whole culture. And the whole culture can move in an emergent, nonlinear way far faster than just an individual can evolve. And so one of the big hopes this century is that our culture, and I don't know how this happens, but our culture moves towards something more sane, more rational, more humane, um, and that people get on board because it's the right thing to do and because that's the direction that our species took. The graphic here is um, the Polynesian canoes culturally evolved. The ones that got better and were able to island hop were selected for. And that was a cultural thing, not a genetic thing. OK, given that it's Earth Day, I'm going to mention uh, some facts about our environment which are not um, in the evening news, uh, but they probably should be. And perhaps the reason they're not um, is because they're pretty depressing. Uh, but I think we need to be aware of them if we're going to engage with them. So one is internal versus external. This is why I left Wall Street 20 years ago, is because I realized a lot of the costs, a lot of the negatives, a lot of the bad things in the environment were external. They were outside of the market system. We didn't put prices on the bad things. We internalized profits and we externalized losses. So the bad things we put to the public commons or to future generations or to the environment. And for instance, coal it costs around four cents per kilowatt hour of electricity generated from coal. If you were to account for all the negative environmental consequences of coal, it would be around 38 cents a kilowatt hour. So yes, I would like to see more environmental damages included in the pricing of the things that we buy at the store. But if we do that, we're going to be far less rich than we are today. We're going to have to work harder. We're not going to be as comfortable. Um, and so there's, there's a trade-off there. Treasure versus riches. So in the last century or so, we have conflated 
treasure, which is economic output and money and digital wealth, with riches, which is the 10 million species we share this planet with, productive, healthy, rich ecosystems and soil, which only get transferred into value in our system once they were processed or harvested. Until then, they had zero value. That's not what a sapient species would do. Civilization versus community. Humans and our livestock, our dogs, pigs, goats, cows, etc., right now, if you weighed them all, humans and our livestock, we outweigh all the wild animals on Earth by 50 to 1. So, in this building of this civilization, we have neglected our nieces and nephews and cousins in nature, partially because we don't see the impact. The impact is out, outside of our realm, which leads me to this, which is a lot of the environmental stories we hear about are things that can be seen. We can measure the fact that we've lost 50% of animals in the, since 1970. But there's a lot of things that are unseen. So France has lost a third of its bird population in the last 30 years. Germany, in their nature reserves, and we don't know about the rest of the country, but in the nature reserves, they've lost 75% of their insects. If you look in the Marianas Trench in the bottom of the ocean, five miles underneath the ocean sea, the shrimps and organisms down there have 50 times the mercury and other toxics than in a polluted Chinese river. Human sperm count in the industrialized world is down 50% since 1970. There are all these micro-level impacts which we can't see with the naked eye, but they're ongoing because of this industrial enterprise. Cultural. The game versus the plan. So the game right now is that we maximize quarterly earnings as small businesses, as large corporations, as nations, as a culture. And that is the plan, is that if we maximize earnings today, that will have the best outcome for Salina in 2040 or 2060. But what ends up happening is we cooperate at these scales to provide brain services, feelings, to as many voters as we can. Those brain services are highly correlated with energy consumption. Energy consumption is highly correlated with fossil energy consumption. And so we are de facto functioning as a dissipative structure. If you take a, uh, a, a measure, the CO2 level in Mauna Loa volcano in Hawaii, at any time in the last 50 years or 100 years, a scientist could interpolate the size of the human economy based on that. So we are in many ways functioning like a energy dissipating structure. And instead of planning for what's going to happen, and in my opinion, we're going to run out of options to keep things growing, and we're gonna have a smaller economy, and we're gonna all have to react to that. And I think there will be some scary things and some unbelievably positive things, but no one is planning for that. There's not a single institution or government in the world that is planning for anything less than 2% growth this the entire the next 50 years. So growth is the plan, the game is the plan. Narrow versus wide. Well this just means that when we look at a question, when we look at a problem, there can be many correct answers depending on how wide of a boundary you put on the question. For example, if you have a new policy for taxis in New York City, they're going to have some impact on the taxi driver. They're going to have some impact on the taxi company. They're going to have some impact on the taxi authority of transportation in New York. They're going to have some impact on New York City. They're going to have some impact on New York State. They're going to have some impact on the Eastern Seaboard and America and the world and future generations. It depends on what your boundary of analysis is when you're asking a question. Most of our culture asks very narrow boundary questions when our challenges are wide boundary issues. Finance versus ecology. 
I'm 51 years old. During my lifetime, our culture has used finance, the rules of finance, as what to aspire to. And I think this coming century is we're going to use the words of ecology, which is looking at how ecosystems work, individual population, community, ecosystem, biome, biosphere. Um, that's going to be more of, of the story. And in, in Salina, we'll call it ecosphere. <clears throat> That was reference to you, sir. Um, <laughs> unlimited versus limits. So we think that the world is unlimited. At least our economics teachers teach that, and most of our cultural leaders do. Um, but there are limits, and there are rational reasons to have limits. I mean, if you look at a chart of growth like this, and you look at a finite earth, a sixth grader can know there are limits. So in our lifetime, there are going to be limits uh, in the lifetime of everyone in this room. And I think certain things that might be politically untenable now might not be in 10 years from now. For example, a limit on the difference between the richest person in a company versus the lowest paid, that there needs to be a cap and a floor something like that. Maybe we could maximize at 100 times what the lowest employee earns instead of 16,000 times or something like that, as one example. But we are hitting social limits to growth already. A lot of Americans are making less money than they did 15 years ago after inflation. This is why it was going to be Trump or Bernie in the election, because they were the only people speaking to that demographic, the flyover country, where I live, where you live. A lot of people recognize, without knowing the energy and money details of this, that things aren't working the way they were in the past. Um, and they're upset about it. So one of the problems is we've parsed all of the things of value in our tribal past into one metric. All the things that we've cared about, we've parsed into dollars. And in doing so, we've lost some of our humanity. Uh, America, okay, so here's from this week, is curing patients a sustainable business model? Goldman Sachs has a report. So if we parse things that cannot be parsed into dollars, into dollars, our culture has a serious problem. This is one of the richest countries in the world. We also have 4.5% of the world's population, we use 20% of the oil, 50% of the world's medical prescriptions, 50% of the toys, we have the highest prison population, we have more guns per capita than any other country. Um, Well-being levels are way lower than other countries which make less than us. We have a cultural story that needs to be addressed. Okay, this is the, as dark as it's going to get, and then it's going to lighten up after this. <laughs> but our species, historically, when we ran into problems, we went to war. And we need to solve this problem that I'm talking about, or it's going to happen again. The good news is that in the developed world, we use 50 to 100 times more energy and resources than our bodies need. So it's not like we're remotely poor. We have many, many, many ample trajectories to have meaningful, great, fulfilled, balanced lives, but not if we're all pursuing this, which is what the current story is. So um, I think this is war versus peace is a valid spectrum to include in this story. Population versus consumption. When we think about the carbon pulse, the amount of energy that's gonna go up and come down over the next couple hundred years, we immediately think, oh, there's going to be fewer people, there's going to be a big die-off. And while that's possible, it's not likely. In fact, just about any trajectory that you have, unless some of the four horsemen of the apocalypse arrive, is going to have six, seven, eight billion people or more alive 50, 60 years from now. So the issue isn't so much population, the issue is consumption. And the developed world, including the United States, is going to have to use less, whether we choose to or not. Um, and and it's, it's more a story of consumption 
And there are many, many examples on this planet right now of countries and communities living on under $10,000 a year that are totally happy and healthy in many, many regards. And the reason they're that way is because the people around them are also in that same boat. The average American uses 38 times the energy of the average Filipino, and yet on subjective well-being studies, we're equally happy. Intelligence versus wisdom. So various cultures, prior cultures, have gotten one crucial thing wrong and they collapsed. The Easter Islanders on Rapa Nui thought that chopping down trees and making these stone monuments to appease their ancestors was the way to get good luck and to continue their future. They were wrong about that. But they were incredibly brilliant on how they did it with the rollers and how they had these massive stone things and they were able to carve them. So the point here is that we are rewarding reductionist expertise. We are rewarding intelligence. And in doing so, we are becoming idiot savants that are like pressing a lever to get a reward when we need to balance that with wisdom. Humans balancing intelligence and wisdom can create amazing special things. This culture is far, far, far too focused on intelligence and cleverness and not wisdom. Which leads me to a related point, which is much of the things that our universities are teaching are incredibly word-based and thought-based and reductionist within a silo, all the way down to the super micro expertise within biology or sociology or chemistry. What we need is generalists. We need sophisticated generalists who know how the real world works. None of us know how to build a microwave. We know how to put a sandwich in the microwave for 30 seconds and then we eat it. A gorilla can learn how to use a microwave in a couple of hours. So we are um, amazingly rich, living at 50 times the throughput of ancestors not that far long ago, but we think they're gonna be do-overs and most of us don't really understand how the physical world works. Popular versus realistic. Stories about flying cars and everyone in Bangladesh living as rich as people in Kansas do today because we're so clever and technology is going to solve it, those are very popular. Um, realistic stories, like I'm trying to share with you tonight, are not popular. In fact, they, people don't even want to believe them because it means they have to do something about it. But popular sells. There's six or 10,000 views of my videos online where uh, Gangnam Style by PSI Korean musician is four billion views. So we conflate the popular with realistic. Should versus will. Many pro-social people in our culture say we should do this and we should do that. But if you look at a history of climate conferences relative to CO2, it's clearly they're missing things about how the human brain works and how we respond. So I think we're, we will have to respond to a smaller economy. It doesn't have to be a disaster. But a lot of things that we say we should do are, are not grounded in uh, the reality of, of individual and group behavior. Left versus right. How many of you uh, have on your Facebook feeds or your social media these vitriolic debates on what's going on with Trump or Hillary did this or Obama? And it's unbelievable how much this country is debating over our political system when the truth is that all of us, and I'm sure there's many Republicans and Democrats in this room tonight, we all really care about the same things. These are some of my best friends and family, and my dog. Um, of the people shown here, half voted for Clinton and half voted for Trump. I voted for neither and my dog didn't vote for either, but the others were split. And the things that we need to talk about are the things that we agree on. Because arguing about Trump versus Clinton, given the, what we face as a society, is like arguing about which mosquito repellent we should be using when a crocodile is biting our leg. 
We need to come together as a culture and fight for what is really important to us, which is clean water in Salina and a good education for my kids and good healthy food and sustainable health care to take care of us when we're old. I mean, the things that we really care about. Economy versus environment. So we're alive during this time, this carbon pulse. This is a kind of a 20,000 year view. We're somewhere between those two red stars. Now, things, if you can come up with, those of you who are environmentalists in the room, if you think of 10 things that would be good for the environment, I could predict that most of those 10 things would be bad for the economy. And most of the things that are good for the economy will probably be bad for the environment. And this is a battle that we have to be first become aware of, and secondly, to care about in order to engage in it. This is gonna be ongoing through this century. Rights versus right. There have been many social contracts in our history. This painting on the right is the Lascaux Cave from 20,000 years ago in France. We had the Code of Hammurabi, which was 3,500 years ago, a social agreement between the people alive in Mesopotamia. We had the Magna Carta and the US Constitution and all of those social agreements were between people at the time who knew what was going on and they arranged an agreement for what mattered. We are now on a full planet. The situation has changed. We know far more about what we're doing and who we are. And so the, conversa this, the, the continuum between rights and right, what is right, is, is open for discussion. Humans are not evil. I think some of my students, when they first learn about the environmental impacts that we're having, they're like, humans are just evil. No, we're not. We wake up every day and we try to get the same neurotransmitters that our ancestors got, and collectively, seven and a half billion strong, we are having adverse impact on the oceans. The ocean, I forgot to say, has lost 2% of its oxygen since 1970. You know, we don't want that to happen, yet is it a byproduct of this global growth system. But I think this is really good news because given different cultural and environmental cues, we're gonna be almost as happy and just as productive and meaningful lives using less stuff and having less environmental damage. Okay, so moving on to the individual and then the conclusion. Certainty versus probability. All of you as virtue of being human, dislike uncertainty. You like to have certainty in your brain. Why? Because it resolves uncomfortable dissonance. So when you hear this story, which I've just really skirted around the edges, because I wanted to tell a story without a lot of facts, um, your reaction, if you're like most people, is one of two things. No, 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 that can't be right. There's no problem, technology's gonna solve it, we're gonna have flying cars and the renewable energy, and we're clever, and we've had this before, and humans have always figured something out. There's no problem. Denial. Or, oh my God, really? That sounds horrible. I'm gonna go play Overwatch in my basement and order some chicken wings. We're screwed, there's nothing we can do. And so I call this denialism. Denial and nihilism, and both of those poles have something in common, which is they obviate any need for personal response and engagement in these issues. Okay, so looking on the right, the future in reality is a probability distribution. It's a normal curve with lots of different events underneath it. Most likely, the future that manifests in Salina in the United States is going to be in between we're doomed and there's no problem. And we need more people in the middle there. So it's okay to have a little uncertainty on these things. Less versus more. So even this story that I'm telling you, there is a physical aspect to it that, oh, I made 50 grand last year. He's saying that I might make 45 in 10 years. That sucks. 
And when you hear that story, it's our optimal foraging theory, animal brains that are, th that are not actually experiencing the physical money or the physical resources. We're just experiencing the story and the story we don't like. Hearing the story is like getting a shrimp and a little asparagus thing. It's like, I don't want to have less. So less versus more needs to be unpacked. Because for most of us, having less, as long as everyone else had less, would actually be healthy and a good thing. Not if you're really poor, then that's not true. But less means less physical stuff. It doesn't mean less of the things that really matter in our lives. But that is why people like me have been saying these things for 20, 30, 40 years with no response. Because people don't want to consider a world with less because the sound of it is like nails on a chalkboard. But it doesn't have to be that way because I would argue physically, yes, but in, in many other ways, we're going to have a different future. And it could be very exciting in many ways. Thinking versus doing. This gets at the question of words and thinking in your head and reading books and not actually doing something. So I've been thinking about this presentation for the last 10 days. My girlfriend, honey, remember we have 15 roosters that you need to kill. Okay, yes, I'll get to it. Meanwhile, I was working on this presentation and other things. The point of the story is three days ago, she trapped three of the roosters in the chicken coop and go out and kill them. Okay, so I went out there and I got dive bombed. One of them hit me in the face. I still have a little bloody thing here. The other two flew out. And as I was walking back, calling my mother-in-law to ask her, like, what the heck do I do about these chickens? My girlfriend trotted out this little pellet gun cider in thing with a chicken on it so that I could sight in my pelican. The point is, is that I spend a lot of my time thinking about doing better things in the future. And I've lost basic skills of how to live on a farm. And this is a microcosm for what the world we're headed towards. We need to think. We need to think about these things. And then we need to do. We need to have physical skills on all sorts of, of things in, in your life. So the average American, again, eats 100 times more calories than we need. And a lot of people, as rich as we are, we're miserable. There's a lot of white males right now that are buying guns because it restores their masculinity. Um, there's all sorts of cultural stories that people have lost a sense of community, a sense of belonging, a sense of purpose. What is our purpose? In this culture, our purpose is quarterly earnings, which is no longer an attainable purpose for a lot of people. We need a completely new conversation we need a conversation about the future where a lot of people can play a role in that future and be connected to a larger tribe. We need a tribe that transcends the market. So when you hear a story like I'm telling you, the immediate reaction is I got better look out for myself, better get some guns and gold and beans and, and whatever. And I tell you that, that that is a natural first response. How do I protect myself for this end of growth thing he's talking about? It's the wrong response. The response is what can I do to make Salina where I've chosen to live a better, stronger, more resilient community? How can I play a role? How can we get the social capital network, the nodes of people who know each other and which skills we have and where the food comes from and all kinds of things? Because, you know, we, we, we function as a community, as a very large community, and that's going to continue to be the case. Functioning by yourself is just a non-starter. So community is vital to what's coming. So a lot of things I'm talking about, if we're worried about the mass, six mass extinction and climate change and resource depletion and you talk about these things, sometimes you feel a little crazy. But frankly, if this is crazy, if the stuff I presented in this talk tonight is crazy, the world needs a lot more crazy. I think we've temporarily conflated crazy and sane. And it's okay to think about this stuff, not only okay, it's actually essential. 
So when you hear a story like this, it depends on your priors. It depends, my friend Wes Jackson has been thinking about this stuff for his whole life. So to him, none of this is surprising or necessarily depressing. If you think that 100 years from now, or in the year 2100, there will be 15 billion humans, all of them with flying cars, living like people in New York City. We've used technology to solve climate change. We've resurrected the passenger pigeon and lots of other species. This story is gonna be horribly depressing. If you think by the year 2100, we're gonna have five or six billion people living like Costa Ricans, we've got 4,200 of the 5,500 mammal species still left, we've managed to keep climate to 1.8 degrees Celsius, that future and many other like it are still on the table. So the hope versus despair depends on your starting viewpoint. So I teach these things to 19 year olds and they get sad, but they have the community of the other students around them. And it's my belief that if you research this and if you become woke to the things that I've talked about tonight, this is our world. And it is not only okay, but probably a little mandatory to carry a little grief around with you. This is an amazing and risky time to be alive but the world is not fully broken yet. And we have to be awake and feel a little bit of this for us to do something. But you also have to have a barbell strategy. You have to feel a little sad, which maybe will cause you to be a little pissed off and to go out and do something, to work on these issues. But working on these issues, thinking about these issues is a little bit toxic. So then you need to take a break and play with golden retrievers or read a sci-fi book or watch some new Netflix show or have a pizza or go play music with your friends or do something totally different than this stuff. But then you come back to it as much as you can. Uh, we're gonna need people to engage in this and feeling a little grief is totally sane. This is the 48th anniversary of the first Earth Day, when millions of people took to the streets to support Earth. And I think though that hippie generation just got burnt out. And my biggest fear is not that we're gonna have a little bit less energy um, or that we're gonna have a few less species because of the size of the human endeavor, but it's that people aren't gonna care. And if we don't care, then we're really in trouble. And so I really exhort you all um, to share with each other. That's the single biggest thing I can tell you to do is find a group of friends and colleagues to talk about these things. And the mere talking about them helps reduce our cortisol, our stress hormones. Um, and then you're gonna come across a plan. And if no plan, you're gonna react to something that, that comes. And all that's gonna be necessary. So coming back to Paul Gauguin's painting. Who are we? Where do we come from? Where are we going? We are the first generation of our species to actually know the answers to these things, scientific answers. Um, the first generation of any species to know these things. We know what we're doing. We know what drives us. We know the difference between wants and needs. We know the environmental impact we're having. Uh, we know that we don't need all this stuff to be happy. And does all that matter? And I think it does. And so I'm telling these story and I'm trying to scale the educational materials beyond my school because my own goal with this is threefold. Number one, to educate and inspire would-be catalysts and small groups working on better futures to integrate a more systemic view of reality. Number two is to empower individuals to make better personal choices given the context of the future I've laid out on navigating and thriving during the great simplification, which is what I call it, coming our way. And number three, change what is accepted in our cultural conversation to be more reality-based. And with that, I extend to you all an invitation to participate in the future. Thank you.
So, let's have a conversation. Who wants to start? Yes. Um, are you familiar with the country of Bhutan and their idea of the gross national happiness? Yes, I am. How might um, other communities transition from an idea of gross domestic product to gross national happiness? Yes. So the kingdom of Bhutan. The Kingdom of Bhutan um, has as their stated goal, the king there has chosen gross national happiness as a cultural goal. Um, there are alternative measures to GDP. Um, there's something called the GPI in America, which stands for Genuine Progress Indicator, which subtracts the bads out from the goods. So our, our growth is this, but if you stra uh, subtract out oil spills and prison and things like that, then it shows a different metric. And Oregon and Maryland are trying to uh, start with that. Um, the temporary problem with that is that the people that own the products of GDP are not going to willingly accept happiness certificates in lieu of their digits that can buy energy uh, and other stuff and power. But in the long run, something cohesive like that uh, makes sense. So I'm hopeful that an alternative to GDP will happen. Um, I think we will face a crisis before that. And then that hopefully will be one of the ideas laying around that we will will use. And there's a lot of people working on that. Yes, more questions. Yes, sir. Yes. How we do that individually and collectively. Drawing upon your background in investment banking and so on, what roles do you think and what, how can you overcome things like commitment bias and some cause into our, uh, into our collective and individual? Uh, uh, I don't know what commitment bias is. Well, it's just sort of saying, I, I'm going to continue to do this because I've got so much already invested in this. So that uh, probably from an economic standpoint, saying, "What is this going to? Uh, we've got so much invested in the way we do this. Yeah. Is this any different? Is, is yeah, yeah. Scary? So, um, so what you're saying is that the momentum of our current system is so strong that it's been difficult for elite key nodes to to change to go against that. And how do we do that? Well. Um, I don't know is the short answer, uh, but I'll, I'll share a little story that when I was managing people's money on Wall Street, I was afraid of losing their money. Wasn't afraid of losing my own, but I was afraid of theirs. So I hired a neuro-linguistic programmer to psychologically help me get over that. And what his message to me was, is when you're afraid of something, you actually don't, you shouldn't go away from it, you should go towards it. And he had me start on marbled orb weaver spiders in North Carolina. And I was petrified of spiders, and over a couple of weeks I got to, to the point where I had one in my, in my hand, very briefly. Um, <laughs> and so the point is, is that, uh, and I know a person very close to me who shall not be named, is the tightest miser I have ever met in my life. And he's never given a penny to charity or anything. And I've had this conversation with him, and I forced him to give $2,500 to a charity. And it was kicking and screaming. He couldn't do it. But once he did it, it was like this thing had been lifted, like the sieve had been broken. And so I think we have to have little models like that. And as a community, the wealthy people in Salina, assuming you're all going to be in this together in the next decade, when I suspect this is going to unfold, you know, the wealthy people are going to have to invest in these pro-social arrangements for young people in this community. It's not going to come from Chicago or New York City. It's going to be the people that have amassed digital surplus during their lives, you know, I'll be frank, are going to have to play an outsized role in this new commitments and in other generations. It's going to take courage. It's going to take vision. It's going to take creativity, and it might not be popular on the surface. Those are the types of things that are going to help. More questions. How about a student? This makes sense to you? Craziness? Depressing? You knew it all? <laughs> one brief sentence. One of you say one brief sentence. What does that mean? 
Okay, we'll come back to you. Yes. I'm really taken by that idea of things that are good for the environment versus things that are good for the economy. And it just seems like that, those are important conversations to Jim. And so, do you have any ideas for how, how to create community conversations? Around yeah, well, first of all, there is no one in our current culture, the politicians, the CEOs, the foundation leaders that have it as their job description to describe and plan for a world with flat or declining growth. Because we didn't elect them, they didn't get to their position by asking that question. They got there because they were good at the other question. So it, I think it starts with education and then it starts with the heart. Do I care about this? Do, am I willing to have birds and insects and clean water in Saline County more than a few extra jobs? I mean, I don't know what the trade-offs would be here, but those questions need to be, I mean, I suggested to someone yesterday that yes, there's a county board here or a city board or whatever. It's gonna be very difficult to have this conversation at the city board level or the county board level. But maybe you could construct a plan B, a shadow committee, that even if they didn't accomplish anything, their senior people who are rational and mature and are connected and they can be talking about these things as kind of like a plan B offshoot. That if these things kind of arise, those nodes of the social connections and the conversations have already been started. That would be a great idea if all of our cities did something like that. Um, just give 1% of the resources, the extra surplus, to research these questions. What does this mean for Central Kansas in these scenarios? Yes, ma'am. Oh, hi. So the question is, frat, frat pack? Flat pack in the UK is doing something like, like I just described. I've never heard of them. Um, that's very interesting. Maybe via Wes, you could send me some information on that. Thank you. Um, you guys ready yet? Okay. Yes. Ah. Right, so the question gets to, I think the reductionist isn't really what you were after there. It was more about education about the wider system and that most people sign up to learn about a reductionist expertise to fix toenails on Dotson Kuhnhaun crosses or something really esoteric like that um, because that'll give them a job. But my opinion is if there's 2% of you kids learning what you are from Aubrey's class, then you look a little weird. But if there's 10%, then all of a sudden it's cool because you have a momentum that you're learning about the real world. And if it's 15%, we have a social movement. So I think the answer is we need to start teaching about energy, ecology, human behavior, younger at colleges. And the colleges need to morph into important education that's gonna be relevant to your lives, but also is, is got a tether to physical world. So I, I, you know, the ecosphere studies thing that I've heard, that's great. We need to use the land and your small population here, which means you're flexible to move to do things with the land, uh, physical resource production of food and, and you know, those sort of things. Uh, but that's an excellent question. And I think you guys are so great. My students give me so much hope because they understand this stuff, but they're 19 year olds and they're not yet sucked into the vortex of conspicuous consumption. They don't have a baby or a boss 
or a job or a mortgage payment or in many cases a car. So they're smart enough to understand how all this stuff fits together, but they're not yet addicted to this. And that gives me hope. If the election would have been six months later, Bernie would have won in a landslide because of all the 17 year olds that would have voted for him. So it's the young people, look at what happened in Florida. That is gonna change. My students don't want the trappings of all this massive money and accumulating wealth. They want quality of life, um, which they really, they're not being taught, they're doing it by default, which is they go on camping trips instead of flying somewhere. And it's, it's friends and occasionally some marijuana and music, and, <laughs> but they, they're after a quality of life sort of thing. <laughs> okay, more, more <laughs> questions. <laughs> yes, sir, and then you. Uh, I tell my kids that I'm hitchhiking in the direction of sapiens. I don't have wisdom myself, so I'm still learning every day about how to be more wise. Um, I, th I mean, I'm not a religious person, but I think the Buddhists have quite a bit going for them. In, w in, in Buddhist economics, wealth is assets over desires. And if your desires are really low in the denominator, well, it doesn't matter what your assets are because your wealth is huge. So I think, yeah, we, I mean, I don't know how to teach wisdom, but that's an excellent question. Do you have suggestions how to do that? Actually, what I, sorry, because I went to the presentation yesterday on story and how important story is. Uh -huh. And actually spoken story because you have to visualize and create in your own head. Um, and so, I mean, so much of what we're getting now is story with images already. Right. And so I was going to follow up the question of did you know any good story? I mean, maybe in a sense you are trying to tell a story. Yeah, and, and I am trying to tell a story, but this is not a good story because it's too complex and it, it makes your head hurt instead of feel good. So maybe this could be broken into 20 little stories, I don't know. Um, but you're absolutely right, humans respond to stories. And we inherently know right from wrong. I, I recently was at a talk in Saudi Arabia and the people there were so warm and friendly to me, it was unbelievable. There are good people, the vast majority are be good people in every single country on this planet. There's a few crazies and fanatics in every country, including ours. Um, but most people just want good food and family time and their friends and uh, Dotson, Jack Russell cross and go fishing once in a while and just, you know, the best things in life really are free once we have our basic needs met. Um, so I wish we were more wise as a culture. Uh, and maybe we need some of the elder statesmen to play a role. Maybe there needs to be a capstone for anyone turning 65 to share their wisdom with young people. I don't know what it looks like, but you're absolutely right. We need more wisdom. Sir. Locally, we have an issue of media conglomeration. Uh, ben Bagdickian commented that in the 80s we had 50 companies that controlled the information that came down, now down to about five. Locally, we have a newspaper that's been bought by a company who owns most of the Western Kansas newspapers, many of those with the Topeka Capital Journal, the Austin, Texas paper, uh, Gatehouse is in Cincinnati. And we have a media company that has now, that presently owns two thirds, roughly, of the stations in the Salon and Ann area. And a majority of the stations on west to the western to the western border, called that. So my question is, in the face of these realities, not just locally but nationally, and I'm, I suspect locally as well, what kind of observation do you make about how we respond to that sort of information control? Um, so the question is the concentration of media resources uh, locally around here and in the rest of the world. How do I respond to the concentration of, of media resources? Well, it's the Walmart story that has happened to media. It's kicked out the mom and pops because it was more cost efficient and maybe there was some super silverback gorilla at the helm that wanted the power to tell the story um, without naming names. And um, I, I think that's a real risk. And how do people respond to that? 
Most people don't know about that. Most people look at the news and they just eat it. I've not had a TV in 19 years. And I do use the internet quite a lot. Um, but I, I gave up television because it's just passive consumption of stuff. And I think you young people especially, if you remember nothing else from this talk, um, you have to be able to think for yourselves and avoid the consensus trance. And if something sounds a little shaky to you, research it, look it up, ask your friends about it. Because the, you know, that is a big risk, is the media is not telling the truth. And that's a separate risk from us not believing the media ever, right? Because then that links into not believing science. And if we don't believe the media or science, we're in real trouble. So that needs to be some independent journalism needs to be funded and supported. Um, you know, I, I do watch on the internet. I watch Al Jazeera, uh, you know, from Qatar, to because it's good news. Um, sorry, RT. yeah, RT sometimes. So uh, yeah, that independent media very very important in this fake news uh, world. More questions? Yes, sir. Oh, one more. We have to leave. All right, so um, one more question apparently, and then I'll be up here if someone wants to come up. I've got two books that are for my students that are about a thousand pages that I have in little PDF form. If, you know, get in touch with Aubrey and I can send you those of the who are interested, but it describes the ecology, the human behavior, the energy, the environmental situation, and a what to do section that's 60 pages. The entire 60 pages of what to do is not about go buy an electric car or go buy solar panels. The entire 60 pages is how to think how to have a conversation with yourself about these things, about your time in the world, about how to be happier using a different sort of paradigm. And because all those other things, the solar panels and the electric cars and the not eating meat and the not, those are all secondary mechanisms. The first thing is you as an individual to become more flexible, more aware and more robust in this environment. So that, you know, I don't certainly have the answers, but I think it starts with the brain and, and your own behavior. One more question. Sir. I moved here from Austin, Texas. And uh, there are folks in Austin who are raised chickens in their backyard. They've dug up in the front yard and they plant corn and tomatoes and other kinds of vegetables. They seem quite happy, but that hasn't uh, extended to various other developments in the area. So uh, chickens are amazing creatures. Um, they're amazing energy harvesters because you let them out and they'll go a football field away and get the bugs and seeds and minerals and things like that and come back and have an egg for you. And my girlfriend is vegan, but she does eat the eggs from our chickens. Those sorts of examples will be very important uh, in the future. Um, so a lot of cities would not allow that to happen because it would be against the zoning uh, laws of the city. Chickens are too loud. Oh, okay. <laughs> what about this town? Could you grow chickens in the, in the city in this town? Oh, see, that's a rarity. Yeah, yeah, but still, that's good. All right, I'm getting the hook from the boss here. So thank, thank you all.